Aloha everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And welcome to my home webinar studio, which also happens to be my guest bedroom and storage area for wrapping paper and extra towels and linens and a rug cleaner. But today, it's mainly a home webinar studio. Thanks for joining us today for a virtual briefing about coastal resilience in Hawaii, with a special emphasis on that state's approach to resilience financing. Even though we're not meeting today in person, I'd like to thank the office of Senator Brian Schatz for their support leading up to today. I wish we were meeting in person and I wish we were less under less difficult circumstances. I hope everyone joining us today is doing okay and feeling well. If you're joining us today for the first time, we're engaged in a briefing series that looks at regional approaches to coastal resilience. Last week, we moved the first of several briefings to a webinar format so we could bring you lessons of coastal resilience from across the Southeast. In 2019, we brought together panels of experts, practitioners, and community leaders from the Gulf Coast, the Northeast and New England, Louisiana, and the West Coast. One month ago, we convened experts who discussed efforts around the Great Lakes. And of course, last Friday, we looked at the Southeast. Next up, we'll round out our briefing series with panelists from Alaska and more. If you've missed one of our briefings on coastal resilience or any cl other climate and clean energy policy topic for that matter, you can access briefing summaries and videos at www.eesi.org. And when you visit us online, please take a minute to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter to learn about other resilience initiatives, clean energy legislation, and to stand informed about all manner of ESI goings on, including our briefing schedule. We're currently evaluating our briefing schedule and how this new online approach is working. I'm pretty sure you'll receive announcements and registration links for more briefings via webinar in the coming days and weeks but we might need a tiny pause to make adjustments and corrections as we master this new medium. I happen to think this online webinar-based substitute for congressional briefings is working pretty well, but as you can imagine, I have a certain bias. It would help us a lot to know how to improve our webinars if you would take a moment to fill out our survey at the bottom of the livecast page on our website, again, www.esi.org. Since last week, unfortunately, the news of the coronavirus outbreak has only gotten worse and the adjustment to teleworking and social distancing might already be taking a toll on some of us. The next few weeks will new, pose new challenges and cause us to make additional sacrifices as our public health professionals carry out their heroic work. But as we have since 1988, at ESI, we're doing our best to stay focused on the threat of climate change. And your need for timely and accountable information is still very much a driving force behind our work. That's why we'll continue to bring up new opportunities to hear from climate, clean energy, and resilience experts via a webinar. You'll also continue to receive newsletters and links to fact sheets. Climate change might not, as, not, might not feel as urgent today, relatively speaking, because of the immediate threat of the coronavirus outbreak, but it is. It's extremely urgent, and so we'll continue to be, for, be here for you as a resource. One last bit of logistics before we turn to our panel. Because we're not in the same room today, I can't call on you if you have a question. So please follow ESI on Twitter at ESI online and send in your questions that way. You can also send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We'll draw from your question submissions after we hear from our panelists. All questions will be at the end of the panel. And now on to our panel. And let me say at the outset, thank you panelists. Um, it's uh, just after 9 a.m. Uh, local Honolulu time. So thank you for getting up in the morning uh, so early and being ready for us. We wish we could have hosted you in DC but we really appreciate everyone's flexibility and accommodation as we wanted to bring this uh, really important information to our audience. So thanks just at the outset for your flexibility. I love this topic. Um, I love what Hawaii is doing. I can't wait to get started. And our first panelist is Alex Craig. Alex is the director of the American Green Bank Consortium, a project of the Coalition for Green Capital. The consortium is a membership organization comprised of 15 green banks from across the U.S. Previously, Alex was the acting executive director of the Montgomery County Green Bank, the nation's first county level green bank. He's also led the work, he's also led work on the Nevada Clean Energy Fund and other coalition for green capital initiatives. Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for the introduction, Dan. I uh, really appreciate it. And thanks for everyone uh, uh, on YouTube for bearing with my uh, background here, um, which uh, 
is better than the actual background I have, which is of a somewhat messy apartment and my wife who is currently scowling at me. Um, but uh, <laughs> we're uh, glad to be able to have a chance to speak with everyone uh, on this webinar today. Um, as Dan said, we're dealing with an incredibly important subject that's being eclipsed for all the right reasons uh, for um, uh, the current public health crisis that we're facing as, a, as, as the world. Um, but we do want to keep uh, progress moving. Um, so I'm really glad that Dan has agreed to host and continue this uh, webinar uh, series. Um, so uh, what is, it? so I'm the head of the American Green Bank Consortium. And as Dan said, that's a collection of 15 green banks from across the country, from Hawaii to Rhode Island. Uh, the head of Hawaii's Green Bank, Gwen Yamamoto Lau, is going to present uh, after me. Um, and uh, we are in 11 different states in the District of Columbia. Um, what, what is a green bank, you might say? Well, uh, green banks are dedicated finance institutions, often public or nonprofit, that work to connect clean energy projects with capital. Green banks are not banks in the sense that they take deposits. So you're not gonna walk into Gwen's shop and come out with a toaster. Instead, green banks ensure that financing, the lifeblood of any clean energy project is readily available to green initiatives in a green bank's jurisdiction. Often, green banks tackle the toughest problems in the industry, serving as the glue that holds together an otherwise unfinanceable project in the eyes of the private sector. So we, in green bank world, are not in the business of competing directly with private capital in perfectly liquid markets. That's not our business. Instead, our business is expanding the pie of, fin of the financing market for clean energy projects across the country so that we can continue to grow our clean energy economy uh, in the United States and around the world um, as our international team works on. So what are green banks doing in this time of crisis? I do want to have have a special point out, and I think you'll get a little bit more information from Gwen uh, when she presents as well. But green banks are really, right now, exploring all the ways we possibly can to help our partners in the communities, in the communities that we live in. So this is, we're, such as we're exploring ways to use green bank capital to support supply chains and local economies through innovative solutions and partnerships. And we're also evaluating the parts of the financing market that are likely to be the hardest hit in the current crisis we're experiencing and thinking about ways that green banks can help fill the gaps that are going to appear. Now, we turn to another emergency, the climate emergency, as Dan referenced. In order to turn the battle, in order to turn the tide in the battle against climate change, we really need to mobilize enormous levels of investment in a new clean power platform across the globe. In the United States alone, the cost of transitioning to a 100% clean energy electric grid over 20 years would require an annual average investment of $225 billion per year, conservatively. That's according to a Wood McKenzie study that was released uh, last year. And this is only talking about the power grid, never mind other sectors of the economy that will need to be decarbonized. However, in the US in 2018, only 64 billion in new investment was put into renewable energy projects, which sounds good, but in the grand scheme of things, it's only marginally more than 2011, when 62 billion of new investment occurred. Beyond our shores, total investment in clean energy technologies slowed by 39% in the first half of, 20, half of 2019. And we're about to find out uh, uh, what the uh, pace was in the second half of 2019. Much of that decrease was due to rapidly slowing investment in China. And none of these numbers take into account the cratering effect of the current global pandemic on clean energy markets. Growth in new investment in a clean power platform simply isn't where it just needs to be, here in the United States or around the world. And clearly something needs to be done about this. It's our belief that one of the key moves necessary to combat this global crisis is to cause hundreds of billions of dollars to be invested in clean energy technologies rapidly and steadily, starting right now. The U.S. must lead the world in this initiative and be prepared through trade and treaty agreements to compel the rest of the world to follow in a rapid reduction of emissions. We also must assure that middle and low income families do not bear the cost of the transition from carbon to clean. How can we achieve this rapid shift? Can the federal government simply subsidize its way to the necessary level of investment? Clearly not if we want to have a penny left over to deal with any of the other pressing issues that we face. 
Can private investors move more quickly and take the necessary risks and soldier through the ups and, ups and downs of financial markets without continuous support from the government? Probably not, as our current investment shortfall clearly demonstrates a market failure to address the climate crisis. The right solution is public-private investment. Public and private resources combine all the time, such as when a state, when a government pays for a highway, but a private company builds the rest stop on the side. There are no shortage of public-private combinations, and what we need is a trillion dollars of such combinations invested in the new clean power platform, and fast. That's why in July of 2019, Senators Markey, Schatz, and Blumenthal, and Van Hollen introduced the National Climate Bank Act, and Representative Debbie Dingell introduced a companion bill in the House in December 2019. The National Climate Bank Act was also included in the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Democrats' Clean Future Act. Green banks connect clean energy projects with the capital in the most economically efficient manner possible, offering financing for these projects as opposed to one-off subsidies. The green bank model has been proven in the states, the laboratories of democracy, where green banks have collectively caused over $4 billion in investment since 2011, with every public dollar at risk bringing along $3.40 of private capital with it. And that's a number we expect to see increasing as uh, the effects of capital recycling take effect. According to an analysis from my parent organization, the Coalition for Green Capital, this national climate bank, capitalized with $35 billion, would cause over $1 trillion in total investment dedicated to building out a new clean power platform. The National Climate Bank Act would do four, three things. First, it would do project finance directly at the federal level investing in massive climate mitigation and climate, climate adaptation projects that state and local green banks in the U.S. simply do not have the capacity to fulfill. Second, it would create new state and local green banks where they do not yet exist. And third, it would provide billions of low-cost financing to existing state and local green banks like Gwen's, which will allow them to scale up their existing operations. The climate bank is built to move at the speed of the private sector. The bank will be an independent nonprofit outside of government entirely. The bank's overriding focus will be to maximize emissions reductions per public dollar at risk, which ensures investment discipline and doesn't overlap with the critical work that government and nonprofit organizations are doing to stimulate innovation in the industry. The bank will also only allow to be in, to invest in projects that provide clean power, the same or lower price than residents and businesses were receiving prior to the transition to clean power. Many customers will in fact be able to re realize substantial savings due to the rapid cost declines realized as a result of tech technology and manufacturing productivity gains. Since 2010, the cost of electricity from wind and solar projects has dropped by a 15% rate annually with cost declines forecasted to continue. When cheaper technologies are combined with low cost financing offered by the National Climate Bank, there's suddenly enormous opportunities for customers to lower their energy bills while transitioning to the clean power platform. The Climate Bank will also prioritize investment in traditionally underserved and vulnerable communities. Low-income residents devote a much larger percentage of their budget to energy costs, so we must ensure that the benefits of the clean energy transition make their way to these customers. In the realm of financing resilience, specifically, the National Climate Bank Act would build off existing successes from green banks in the U.S and also look to dramatically scale up the financing of these types of projects in innovative ways. As many of you know, in the world of climate policy, there are two traditional categories, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation means proactively com combating the causes of climate change. For example, adding ele clean electricity generation, such as wind or solar to the electricity grid. Adaptation means exactly what it sounds like, adapting to the changing world we live in to be better prepared to adapt to and recover from the consequences of climate change. And I'm sure Dan and the EESI team have a, a much tighter definition than that, but I'm giving you a, a, a general broad stroke here. When you think of adaptation, think of a seawall to protect a community from rising tides or a microgrid that allows a community to keep critical services such as fire and rescue up and running when the larger electricity grid fails due to severe weather. Or think of natural solutions that some of my fellow panelists are going to be speaking about later today. Generally speaking, mitigation activities such as deploying clean electricity generating resources are easier to finance because of the expected future cash flows that arise from these technologies. 
When you build a solar panel, it's going to generate electricity, which has value and you can sell or use for your own to displace your current bill. A bank can feel confident lending to a solar project because the project itself will result in the generation of this valuable commodity, the proceeds of which can be used to repay the loan. Now note that I said financing mitigation is easier than adaptation. Not that financing mitigation is easy. Currently, even with the quintessential literal burning platform of climate change, new investment renewals is nowhere near where it, it needs to, where it, requi it is required to be in order to stave off the worst effects of climate change. Adaptation activities, however, do not benefit from the same intrinsic cash flow generating back characteristics as mitigation activities such as wind and solar. Generally, adaptation projects provide less quantifiable financial benefits than mitigation, meaning that lenders are more hesitant to make loans to these types of projects. A seawall might save property damage for homeowners that live on a shoreline, but as far as a lender is concerned, this is an unpriced positive externality of the project, and unpriced positive externalities don't put food on the table for lenders. Safe to say, the larger nut of adaptation financing has yet to be completely cracked. This is where green banks are beginning to step into the void. Green banks have begun to apply themselves to the task of sniffing out quantifiable cash flows or savings associated with adaptation projects and have already had some success. In Florida, the Florida Solar and Energy Loan Fund has created a program that takes advantage of the insurance premium savings enjoyed by homeowners that harden their roofs against the threat of hurricanes and use that anticipated savings to help secure a loan provided by SELP to finance the upfront cost of the entire project. Green banks are leading the charge to find creative ways to bring cap to, capitalize, to capitalize on future cash flows or else savings that adaptations projects produce. Gwen is also likely going to be speaking about a microgrid project that uh, her organization financed and a number of green banks across the US have financed microgrid projects as well. So this type of financial innovation will require patience, creativity, and long-term thinking, which green banks have in spades. And as more governments and financial institutions, especially in the insurance industry, are recognizing the value of these types of adaptation projects, more ways to bring expected future cash flows or future savings associated with these projects will be identified by green banks. The National Climate Bank would allow for these types of innovating financing techniques to flourish at scale. Then Representative Chris Van Hollen introduced the Green Bank Act in the U.S. House of Representatives in 2009. He's now Senator Van Hollen and was an original co-sponsor of the bill this past year as well. When it was first tried to create a federal climate bank in 2009 and 2010, the concept was included in the House passed American Clean Energy and Security Act, also known as Waxman-Markey. However, the bill was a casualty when climate change legislation bogged down and eventually died in the Senate in 2010. Nearly a decade later, and with the Green Bank model successfully proven in states and cities across the country, we're more optimistic about this than ever, this particular effort to get the bill over the finish line so that we can ensure American leadership in the battle against climate change. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to answering any questions that folks have in the uh, follow-up session here. Thanks, Alex. That was a great presentation. Um, and uh, since you gave me an opportunity for a plug, and I'm never one to let an opportunity for a plug get, pa go past, uh, we actually just did a new fact sheet on nature-based solutions. So a different approach to some of those adaptation um, strategies. Um, if you go to ESI.org under publications, it's the, the first fact sheet that pops down. It's a great, it goes through all the federal resources that are available. And then also you asked, you just mentioned questions. For those who might have joined us a little bit late, just a reminder, um, we are gonna have time for questions. Um, the best thing to do is to follow ESI on Twitter, uh, at ESI online and ask your questions that way. Um, and we'll go ahead and ask those at the end of our panelists. Uh, speaking of panelists, let's go to panelist number two. Um, our next panelist is uh, Gwen Yamamoto Lau. She was appointed executive Infrastructure Authority in January 2017. Uh, the authority was created in November 2014 to administer the Green Infrastructure Loan Program, which was capitalized with a $150 million green energy market securitization bond issuance. And uh, Gwen, uh, Alex gave you quite a lead in. Really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, share my screen, my PowerPoint. One second.
There we go. Well, good morning and aloha from Hawaii. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have that gorgeous Wisconsin farmland background that Alex has. You're looking at my kitchen pantry door. How exciting. <laughs> but anyway, um, in putting together this presentation, like any intelligent person would do, I confirmed the definition of climate change mitigation and resilience with the trusted source called Wikipedia. <laughs> well, all kidding aside, you know, unfortunately, as we all know, climate change and social inequity are major threats to community resilience and sustainability. HGIA was created by Hawaii's legislature to democratize clean energy by providing non-traditional and flexible financing to expand access and affordability to our most vulnerable populations and provide them an opportunity to lower their energy costs while going green. Leveraging our green energy money saver on the repayment mechanism as a tool, we seek to attract private investments and reach new markets. And as a green bank, we are in the unique position to drive job creation, or in the case of today's pandemic, job retention, while being stewards of our precious taxpayer dollars by recycling, reinvesting, and relending that same public dollar over and over again. Why was democratizing clean energy important to our legislature? It's because Hawaii has one of the highest energy costs, which ranges from 26.8 cents to 43.3 cents per kilowatt hour for residential ratepayers, depending on which island they live on. Add our high cost of living to the equation, and it's no wonder that almost half of Hawaii's households are classified as ALICE or below, ALICE being the United Way's acronym for Acid Limited Income, income Constrained employed. And if that wasn't challenging enough to make matters worse, with the median price of a single family home on Oahu at over $800,000, approximately 43% of Hawaii's households are forced to rent, and renters are often locked out of solar options. Last April, we launched our Green Energy Money Saver Envelope Program, available to ratepayers over five distinct islands. One of the most important features of our program is our non-traditional underwriting, which means no credit scores or debt to income ratios. Qualifying for GEMS is a simple two-step process. First, the applicant cannot have had a disconnection notice from the utility over the past 12 months. And second, the energy installation requested must provide an estimated minimum 10% post-installation utility bill savings, and this includes the repayment of our loan. This estimated savings, while not guaranteed, is very important as our goal is to help our most vulnerable ratepayers be in a better place financially after the installation of the energy improvement than they were before. With 43% of our households renting, it was important to our policymakers to ensure that the program was also designed for renters. We did this by tying the obligation to the utility meter, allowing the obligation to transfer from tenant to tenant and offering split incentives and creative terms to eliminate obstacles for landlords. Put very simply, the energy retrofit reduces the energy consumption, which lowers the ratepayer's utility bill. GEMS utilizes this savings to pay for the installation which is conveniently placed on the utility bill for one simple payment and leaves a little extra disposable income in the pockets of our LMI households. I'm excited to share the amazing Kawiki Village or K Village story. K Village is an innovative and groundbreaking initiative which under the leadership of local businessman Duane Kurisu brought the community together in a public-private partnership to collectively build a village for previously homeless families. This project did not rely on tax credits, HUD subsidies, or state housing financing. The first phase consisted of 30 homes with 153 homes planned for the fully built project. Duane was also committed to keeping the rents lower than what was allowable by HUD. However, 
as Alex mentioned, from the lens of an investor or lender for the microgrid, all of the elements that made K Village exciting for everyone else made both investors and lenders very nervous. It was challenging because this project was the first of its kind. As such, there wasn't any historical cash flows that could be used to determine the feasibility of the pro forma financial projections. And without the typical low income housing tax credits or construction loans, there isn't any other party closely involved in the monitoring of the project's ongoing financial viability. And while the first phase of the project was only 30 homes, the development and construction of the microgrid infrastructure needed to be built out for the entire 153 units, front loading most of the costs in phase one, which would initially only be supported by about 20% of the rental units. With a 60 to 40% split of private to public capital, phase one was completed and the first 30 families or 123 individuals moved into their new home on January 12, 2018. We were also excited to participate in the capital stack for the second and final phase of the project, which is almost complete. But the coolest part about this project is that on January 12, 2018, when the first families began moving in, the village was not yet hooked up to the utility grid. In fact, due to circumstances beyond the utilities control, they were not able to connect the project to the utility grid until June. Five months later, the microgrid provided all of the energy needs for these families, its community center, child care facility, convenience store, and human services office without a hitch. An amazing example of a resilient community. Lastly, we are excited about the opportunities to leverage our on-bill repayment mechanism to unlock new markets for our low and moderate income population and renters via community solar and multifamily projects. As an example, we are working with an innovative and progressive local developer, Holoho Energy, to provide energy produced by solar into the individual units of low income and workforce housing multifamily rental projects. By leveraging their technology, they are able to adjust the energy supplied to the energy consumed of the individual units. And by leveraging our on-bill repayment mechanism, we are able to lower the servicing costs and mitigate risks for the system owner and unlock solar benefits for a segment of our population previously not able to participate. Additionally, as these are PV plus storage projects, when the grid is down and other units experience a blackout, these technologies keeps the light on for our participating families. Thank you. Sorry, I'm getting used to the muting, unmuting function. Uh, that was great. Uh, that was great, Gwen. Thanks. And congratulations on all the progress um, of the Hawaii Green Bank to date. It's really, really impressive. And you guys are doing really excellent stuff. I didn't realize, I didn't know the part of the story where you went five, min five months without being connected to the grid. <laughs> so good thing you did that right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on, but just quickly, uh, the questions are almost literally pouring in. So if you have questions, um, you can email us at EESI at EESI.org, or you can also follow us online uh, twi on Twitter at EESI online and submit them that way. So thank you for those. We are getting them and we'll save them until the end of our panel. Uh, and that brings us to our third panelist. Um, Anu Kriti Hittel is, staffs the State Government of Hawaii's Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission and is adjunct fellow at the East-West Center. Before, she was a climate change researcher with the World Resources Institute, an activist at Greenpeace, and a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, where she copes, sorry, <laughs> close the window, where she co-led the research and independent NGOs observer delegations for COPs 20, 21, and 22. Her backgrounds in international relations and forest resource management with a focus on economics, policy, and law. And she included in her bio a quote, a quotation that I thought I would pass along from Aldo Leopold, who said, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. And for the record, Anu is someone who cannot. So Anu, I'm going to turn it over to you. Really looking forward to your presentation today. Thanks for joining us. 
Thank you and aloha everyone. Thank you, Dan, EESI and my fellow panelists for putting this together. I think it's a really interesting panel because um, my two uh, colleagues who went before me uh, have a lot of experience and focus on, on the mitigation side and are also looking at basically they're at, on the front lines. Gwen is on the front lines here in Hawaii uh, to put packages together for our small businesses and so on. Um, so I like to think of sort of the work that I do, I kind of uh, liken it to a water column. Um, and I think of sort of our elected leaders at the top in the pelagic level where they are tossed about by storms like the coronavirus. I think of Gwen as sort of in the middle level where you have the demersal layer, which is, you know, sometimes rocked by the storms, you can get some light but you're also looking down to the benthos and also working on the benthos on that foundational level. For me, I'm right at the bottom of that water column and I'm where the one-eyed fish roam and uh, I'm in the dark. And so we have to create our own light and our own work in some ways, but I'm also here as sort of with my catcher's mitt, just waiting to catch as, um, as we build uh, into the future and go past the, the storms that rock us on a daily basis. So with that um, caveat, I will uh, share my screen and start um, explaining what it is I do down at the benthos level. Are you able to see my screen? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, basically uh, what we're trying to do, I staff the, the state's uh, Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission, and I will talk about that in a little bit, but we're essentially trying to figure out how Hawaii can be climate ready. Um, <clears throat> so a quick uh, overview of what's happening in Hawaii right now, which is that we're experiencing hotter days uh, we've had a two and a half degree Fahrenheit increase between 1950 and 1980, and it continues to get hotter and hotter, as you all know. Uh, we have fewer trade wind days that gives us even hotter days here in paradise. Um, overall, our precipitation has uh, decreased, and when we do get rain, it is heavy uh, and creates situations like landslides and so on. Um, we are also looking at some projections uh, for Hawaii, which are not uh, basically going to, things are not going to get better for us. Um, we, we are in the unique situation here um, of being a completely uh, fully island state. So we are an archipelago here, as everyone knows. Um, and so for us, the mitigation side, the uh, you know, decreasing emissions and so on, of course we want to do that and decrease our carbon footprint. And that also means we will be more resilient. But um, for us, adaptation is a big deal. So as you can see, we've, we've been focusing on sea level rise um, at coastal properties, but also um, inland flooding. So we're looking at just even high tide flooding, what we're calling sunny day flooding. Nothing's happening here except that the water goes up and down twice a day as the ocean does. So that's your tides. And this is not a canal. This is actually a street. And this is an industrial area, Mapuna Puna. If you are planning to come to Hawaii, which please don't for the next 30 days or more, but when you do plan to come here, if you land in Honolulu, uh, Daniel K. Inoue Airport, you will see on your way to Waikiki, you can ask your um, Lyft or Uber driver to take you by Mapuna Puna, and this is what you'll see. Uh, that's uh, <clears throat> not on your standard list of tourist attractions, by the way. But this is what we are seeing. So we're seeing contaminated waters. Now, um, Hawaii has a lot of goals, and I'll just quickly mention that we had put all of these, these are on our website, but um, we put it all in one graph. So you can see we have a lot of goals. The one that I really like to point out here is the, um, the one where we are trying to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. 
Um, and then the one that I will go on to is this one, which talks about in 2015 when the Paris Agreement happened and then shortly after the uh, Act 32, which laid down the framework for the state and its climate change work. And um, this is, uh, I like to uh, put the Eiffel Tower and the Aloha Tower together because this is Hawaii's response to what happened in the Paris Agreement, um, which is, of course, we did a lot of things, as you can see from those goals. But one thing they did was to put into statute the Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission. <clears throat> and so the, the commission um, was established about, this is its third year, I like to say we are, we've gone past our terrible twos and now we're in our hopefully terrific threes. Um, here are some mandates. Uh, so you can see that it's got, you know, the, the uh, it basically needs to provide policy direction around climate change, um, provide strategies and goals and help to establish those, help guide the planning and implementation. Also identify the vulnerable people and communities, industries, ecosystems. So you can see it has very broad ranging um, mandates. And so what we're trying to do is figure out where, where do we start? First though, who is on the commission? So it's a high level, it's the highest level policy recommending body in the state. So it's a high level multi-jurisdictional commission. It's got 20 members and chaired by the Department of Land and Natural Resources where I am based and the Office of Planning, which is under the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, which actually I believe Gwen, um, the, the GEMS program is also based under that, I think. Um, <laughs> state government is pretty big. Um, <clears throat> we also have four legislators. So again, it's multi-jurisdictional, executive and legislative branch of government, county planning directors. So we have our county directors on there. And then the rest of them, you know, are our um, executive branch cabinet and, and so on. So we have Department of Transportation, Department of Education, all the, all the biggies are on there. Okay. That doesn't mean that's all who we work with. We work with many more folks than that. Um, the commission basically came up with a mission statement that includes that a climate ready Hawaii should be clean, equitable and resilient. And so we really focus on those three things, which we believe cover a lot of um, a lot of ground. So on the mitigation side, just really quickly, you know, this picture kind of tells you everything we've been trying to look at. And I'm not going to go into everything here because we're really looking more at the um, I'd like to focus more on the adaptation side of climate ready Hawaii. But this is where um, all, all our conversations about electric vehicles, conversions of state fleets, looking at other modes of transportation, encouraging multimodal, V2G, um, all of those kinds of things. So this is what we've looked at, what we are in various uh, stages, piloting uh, various things. So, so that's on our mitigation side where the commission decided it wanted to look at reducing emissions from ground transportation. That was its focus within that large um, bucket of mitigation. On the adaptation and resilience side, we really, uh, the commission's been looking to support agencies and departments and we've got a four point uh, program. I know it sounds a little Stalin-esque, you know, uh, a five-year plan and a four-point program and so on. Um, but um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's basically uh, the ones that I wanted to bring to your attention um, are the last two, the bottom two, which is to engage our communities to help determine those priorities uh, where we will be looking to, to find funding uh, to support our various um, vulnerability assessments for our, for our um, infrastructure for our investments and our assets. So uh, that's really where Climate Ready Hawaii and my, my work with Gwen uh, comes in. We're looking at this point to um, work on uh, basically uh, looking at climate change induced risk, uh, looking at uh, um, how risk uh, of current, what's happening currently, but also what are projected um, climate change impacts will be to our roads, our bridges, uh, to our uh, pension funds, um, and um, really just, just looking to find community engagement in, uh, to help determine those priorities and then to go out and find the funding for those things. Uh, when we talk with our sister states who, who are working on such things, um, California, uh, Delaware, uh, Massachusetts, 
Um, <clears throat> they have other instruments uh, than we do, so we're looking to finance, um, you know, in some other innovative ways, and that's where our green banks come in. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, I just wanted to segue into my next speaker, my, my panelist um, colleague, uh, who will talk more about these kinds of projects, um, but we're also looking at how do we, um, when we, when we look at moving or shoring up infrastructure, I know that um, there was some talk of seawalls for, for Hawaii, you know, we always sort of shudder when we think of seawalls because seawalls for us means there are no beaches left. So, um, so that's, you know, that's a really tough decision. Do you, do you keep your, um, your roads and your private property and your seawalls? And what do you do then with the public beach, which is accessible in Hawaii, the beach is everybody's um, property, it's the public trust. So um, that's, those are the questions we're dealing with. Um, this is a project that we are um, proposing to do. We're looking, we have uh, secured some funding to begin the planning phases. Um, I should add, it's not just Department of Transportation and DLNR, but it's also the county, city and county of Honolulu. Um, and we're looking at Punalu'u Beach Park, where there is a road very close to the, uh, to the beach. And we're looking at uh, coastal erosion, um, the structure there are uh, comfort stations. And um, we're trying to figure out that with this kind of a scenario of three plus feet likely in the second half of the century, or if you're looking at the extreme scenario of three and a half feet by even as soon as 2060, how do we continue um, shoring up our roads and our essential services in view of this slow and sometimes faster march of climate change. So um, I will leave you there uh, with some contact information and um, take you over to, uh, to my colleague who will follow next. All right. Thanks, Anu. That was great. Um, great presentation. Thanks so much. Um, and I didn't realize the, is the Alo Aloha Tower? Pretty tall. Uh, Eiffel Tower is a pretty tall building. That's pretty cool. I've been to Honolulu. I just don't remember that. I, um, I think we, I think we made it taller than maybe it is. <laughs> oh, so not to scale, not to scale, folks. Not to scale. No. <laughs> Fair enough. It's it's the Hawaii uh, webinar. We can take some liberties. That's fine. Uh, and our to to us that looks bigger from here. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Um, our fourth panelist is Adam Borello. Uh, Adam is a lifetime surfer and lover of the ocean. Uh, he's committed to preserve and protect the unique and special characteristics of his island home. His studies in political science and environmental law together with early experience in local politics inform and guide his approach at the North Shore Community Land Trust, which strives to protect, steward, and enhance the natural landscapes, cultural heritage, and rural character of the scenic landscape of the North Shore of Oahu, uh, which I'm sure is a gorgeous place. And uh, he, Adam, sounds like you're a pretty lucky guy to get to work there. So no further ado, I'll turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much. Morning, uh, happy Aloha Friday from Hawaii. Uh, <clears throat> really appreciate all the effort by uh, the team at EESI to, to organize and, and, and make this happen in spite of the, the many um, challenges. So. Really, I just want to get into kind of for us at the North Shore Community Land Trust where the rubber kind of meets the road. Uh, again, my name is Adam Barella. I'm executive director at the North Shore Community Land Trust. And today I'm going to share with you one of our successful projects that effectively leverages resources and expertise for resilience and mitigation through the lens of habitat and species restoration and preservation. Uh, prior to discussing the details of our Kahuku Point project, which I feel will kind of shine a, a, a bright light on some of the opportunities, I'd like to give a little bit of background about um, the organization itself and how we work. The mission of the North Shore Community Land Trust is to protect, steward, and enhance natural landscapes, cultural heritage, and rural character of Ahapua'a from Kahuku to Kaena Point. Um, as you can see on this map, this is our mission area. Uh, it's, it's a large pie piece uh, on the northern, uh, going back into central Oahu, but from the north uh, easternmost point and northwesternmost point of, of the island of Oahu. For those of you who don't know, an Ahapua'a is a land division. It's a traditional Hawaiian land division. And as you can see from the lines on this map, 
um, the Hawaiian culture and people were really ahead of their time uh, from a standpoint of resource management. These land divisions go, run from mountain to sea. And the idea was that um, these gave uh, individuals or, or communities living in, in these ahapua'a access to the, the various resources you need to survive, but it also gave them something that is very important also in the Hawaiian culture, which is kuleana or responsibility to take care of, to take, excuse me, to take care of and maintain um, these land divisions. So really that's, that's what we're all about. We're about trying to identify opportunities to preserve land in our mission area on the North Shore. What we've learned in, in several years uh, of being around, we're founded in 1997, and together with our community partners, we've learned that if we dream big, uh, of course, and work hard and, and do all the legwork in, in between, uh, big things happen. So the North Shore Community Land Trust was born out of uh, a need to find solutions for a lot of these uh, potential development or uh, failure to identify in some instances opportunities to preserve land in this special mission area. And as is the case around the nation, you know, a lot of these manifest themselves in legal battles, et cetera, and, and it, the, the North Shore is uh, not unique in that sense that we, we've had our fair share of um, struggles out, out to pr protect and preserve land. However, what didn't exist in the minds of a lot of community members was an entity, body, or vehicle to find a solution. Uh, and the North Shore Community Land Trust uh, was born out of a previous um, property struggle uh, uh, called Obe was Obayashi Development above uh, Pupukea Pamalu. Um, that was really our first major success. The work to get there started right after our founding, uh, but it took almost 10 years um, to get to the solution. Uh, in, in 2007, uh, Pupukea Pamalu, which is over 1,200 acres, was protected in perpetuity. Um, fast forward, you know, there's a lot on this slide that, that really, uh, you know, uh, my understanding is that this will be shared through EESI, so I wanted to make sure that there's information that can recap. Don't want to get bogged down in it, but in between, we've done a lot of different community outreach and other efforts to try and make sure that we're continuing to dream big and striving to uh, protect uh, various uh, special properties along the North Shore. So moving on, you know, from that, how do we work? You know, at the end of the day, uh, how we work is by really the grace, the involvement, and the um, passion of partner partners through, throughout um, what we do. So first, we, we have willing land, we, we need to identify willing landowners, uh, structured land transactions that allow for the placement of conservation easements, which uh, place uh, development restrictions or preserve land in perpetuity. So what we've learned not on the island of Oahu, especially where uh, our land is at a very high premium, is that even traditional um, land management mechanisms, uh, for example, you know, having something be uh, the, the, the various zoning laws, having something be zoned agriculture. Um, I live and I'm, I'm reporting to you from a home that sits in Milani town, which is uh, used to be when I was young, uh, all pineapple land. And so these zoning, uh, changes can and do and, and in some instances need to take place uh, to uh, accommodate the, the, the natural evolution of, of what's going on uh, on our island. And yet we feel it's very, it's vitally important um, to also protect and take steps to preserve uh, where we can. So how do we do that? We do that through healthy and effective relationships. These relationships are built on mutual respect and trust. We, we regularly reach out to the community, engage the community, try to provide opportunities for community input. And really at the end of the day, most of what we do is um, informed, guided and, and driven by the community input. Uh, again, we, we work together with landowners. Um, I'll get to the specifics of the, the idea, um, excuse me, the project we're gonna talk about today, government, NGOs, community volunteers, and, and importantly, as it relates to our Kahu Point project, which we'll talk about, we work carefully and closely with the environment. Um, talked a little bit about the community engagement and something that wasn't as 
initially as strong of a piece for us, but has evolved to be a very important part of what we do is the stewardship and education. Um, so I'll just continue on. Taking us to the Kahuku Kavela Forever, which is kind of the uh, introduction to our Kahuku Point project. This project was born out of a long time struggle um, between the community and various owners of the uh, once Kui Lima and now Turtle Bay Resort on the North Shore of Oahu. Uh, basically, there was a, an approved and entitled um, development plan, uh, which was approved many, many years ago in the 80s. And then uh, more recently, in more recent times, new owners uh, got engaged with the property and wanted to um, pursue those development plans. Um, since their approval, a lot has changed on the North Shore. Um, there was a photo, uh, I believe, in one of Anu's slides that showed some of the houses along the North Shore where coastal um, erosion and sea level rise is very real, where we've got, you know, parts of neighborhoods um, or, or, or selected homes within neighborhoods falling into the ocean after large um, swell activity. And so uh, in addition, we've got a, a very real um, pressure from tourism on the North Shore. And so the community pushed back against those originally approved um, development plans and the typical um, battle, if you will, or struggle ensued with uh, lawsuits, et cetera. What we try to do at the North Shore Community Land Trust is find um, a workable solution. Uh, and so with you know, tremendous support and effort from other uh, community groups, we were able to uh, work together with those community groups uh, and others to get to a place where now, if you look at this map, um, over a thousand acres have been uh, preserved um, and will not be developed at, at the Turtle Bay Resort, Resort property. If you look at the brown um, piece there, that's the, what we call the Malka or mountainside land, which is a ag, uh, pre preserved for agriculture, uh, consistent with our mission. And on the Makai side, which is largely the pink side um, or the ocean side, all of the uh, salmon area and the areas furthest to your left and right of the slide um, are also preserved as open green space and or preservation or park. Uh, conservation is, is uh, placed over the uh, <clears throat> the whole of both the ag lands and the preserved areas on the um, Makai side. And so how do we do that? Um, oh, I, and, and I, I apologize. Before I skip from that, because what's also very important for, for us is that we, we are there and working to both preserve uh, the environmental integrity and, and where possible restore it, but we also are vitally in, in, interested in preserving a recreational opportunity for uh, our surrounding community, our island community as a whole. And so when, whether it be uh, my family or friends that happen to go down there or visitors uh, from our neighboring islands uh, that come, we, we are very proud of the fact that uh, part of our conservation easement uh, and the effort is that all of the trails throughout this property are open to the public. Um, there are set aside uh, parking, et cetera, for access. So that's, that's an important point for us as well. And before I leave this slide, the stripes up to the, to the right uh, part of the uh, colored area are the, our Kahuku Point, par uh, um, Kahuku Point property, which is what we're gonna talk about specifically now, approximately 39 acres. So how do we get there? Uh, we got there through, um, basically bringing the community together and then identifying with the, the huge support of the Trust for Public Land, different uh, funding sources in order to uh, make the acquisition happen. Uh, included in those were the State Legacy Lands uh, Program, which is housed within the Hawaii uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources. Percentage of conveyance tax goes into this fund and it's set aside for these types of purposes. Similarly, Clean Water and Natural Lands Act, uh, excuse me, um, for city and county of Honolulu operates very similar. Um, it's a, in that instance, the percentage of property tax. Uh, and finally, we, we, with the help of tr uh, Trust for Public Land, we were successful in securing um, uh, federal funds through the compatible use buffer zone, which is through the US military. Um, and this is why. We, 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 what you're looking at here is, is Kahuku Point. And if you look out to the tip, this is the, uh, northeasternmost point of the island. 
Um, and as you come back in, what you'll see, uh, and I apologize, it's a little dark as you get into the right, but what you'll see is the restoration of these, uh, this coastal, intact coastal strand uh, uh, ecosystem, which I'll, I'll have our staff talk about in this next video slide. But what's important to, to know, the real species, the, the most um, pervasive and difficult invasive species is ironwood. The ironwood um, is both heavy and hardy, and so clearing them out is not easy. And what they do over time is they lay a, a meaningful uh, layer of their needles, which really choke out a lot of uh, the native species. So we've systematically, in the five plus years that we've been out there, been working closely with um, our partners uh, to make progress and restore what you see in the first part of the green, which is which are natives um, crawling. And uh, we'll get to some of those specifics shortly. But uh, what I'd like to do now is share a, a quick sli uh, video slide where some of our staff and key partners are sharing uh, what's going on out at Cooper Point. There's just a feeling that, that comes over you. Just a certain serenity when you're out there. Kahuku Point is really special because it's this community of native plants and animals that used to be one of the dominant habitat types in the Hawaiian Islands. But because of the pattern of exploitation of coastal areas, there's very, very few intact coastal strand habitat types. Through the concerted efforts of the North Shore Community Land Trust, Kahuku Point has been designated as an initial restoration site. For all project is is to provide a native ecosystem for multiple plants and animals, but the keystone species we're thinking of is the albatross. Showing a child a yellow face bee and seeing the wonder and curiosity that the next generation has, that's what gives me hope. So how do we how do we do that work? You know, basically when we get to the acquisition of the, or the transaction, if you will, of the, for the conservation easement, that's the, the first side of the funding. But how we get there with regard to the work that we're doing out um, in the field now is through phenomenal um, funding partners like those listed on this slide. Uh, at, uh, all of these funders are, are equally important, but I would be remiss if I didn't um, point out just how valuable, instructive, and powerful our partnership is with the Pacific Island Coastal Program um, through U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, our cooperative agreement with them uh, has us uh, the beneficiary of a phenomenal, um, and Sheldon was in the previous video, phenomenal field biologist who's, who's able to really help guide and steer um, our, our team and our extended team um, to find success out there. National, National Fish and Wildlife Federation, Hawaii Community Foundation, the resort itself. So we've talked about uh, public and private partnerships. The resort has uh, really stepped up under its current ownership to get behind our work out at the out at Kuku Point, and we appreciate that. Um, at Cook Foundation, Atherton Family Foundation, we surf on uh, Hawaii Tourism Authority, uh, the Midir uh, Ohana Fund and uh, Mohammed bin Zaid. Now these are just our, our larger donors, and and you know I don't want to bore everyone, but uh, it, it truly is a community and team effort, both from the staff, from the other um, supporting uh, partner agencies and, and organizations that we work with. So what does that result in? It results in this beauty that you see on the screen now. So on this, page, on this screen, um, starting in the left hand corner and moving clockwise, we have Akuli Kuli, Hina Hina, um, in the lower right hand corner, Ilima, uh, next to that, the red plant is a coco, and, and the last plant is a pohuihui. All of these plants are, are native uh, plants. Um, and what we found as we peel back those layers, uh, peel back the ironwood forest and, and lift the layer of, <clears throat> excuse me, of ironwood needles is that there is an active seed bank um, uh, underneath. Not all of these plants are, are coming out of the seed bank, but a lot of natives are. Um, Tim Tubashevsky, our conservation director, and Alice Terry, um, our volunteer coordinator, are busy at the task on the regular um, engaging volunteers getting out on the property to, to make this happen. And what does this mean from a resilience standpoint? It means that species that otherwise are losing habitat are showing up and thriving 
on the project site and the surrounding area. So you have endangered monk seals that regularly are in the area, yellow-faced bees as well, um, that are making use of this restored coastal strand uh, uh, habitat. More recently, and we're very excited about this, in the last, uh, after a few years of our restoration efforts, after decades uh, long absence, uh, albatross have been returning. Uh, a, a major favorite of, of our field bi biologist and, and partner, uh, Sheldon Plenovich, who's, who's just a phenomenal resource to us as we, as we go through this process. But what's nice is that talking about a resilience and mitigation standpoint, uh, low-lying atolls, which are, uh, you know, known to be important nesting areas for the albatross and other uh, seabirds are, are being lost to uh, sea, sea level rise. Uh, and the combination of sea level rise and an occasional extreme storm has some of these um, species uh, breeding and nesting areas being eradicated. So what's nice uh, out at the Cuckoo Point property is that we feel like we're preparing and, and restoring an opportunity and we couldn't get a better endorsement than nature uh, saying like, hey, uh, we feel you're doing a good job and the, and the albatross are back. Uh, we've seen the nest numbers increase. Unfortunately, uh, this year we are, are down to three chicks, but we're hoping that all three of those chicks will fledge. Uh, we work closely with partner organizations to manage the effort around the species, the animal species. We have a comprehensive predator control grid around uh, the property in order to try to maximize their success. And how do we do it? We do it with a, a phenomenal amount of volunteers, a, a passionate, engaged, and caring community, and with just amazing partners. So these are volunteer work days. Here in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see Surfrider Foundation. They do a huge amount of work together with us on the ocean side. Um, with you, we're out at that point where our trades do come through. So there's unfortunately a lot of plastic debris that comes up. So Surfrider Foundation and Plastic Free Hawaii have been phenomenal with that. Um, H oh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Hawaii uh, Marine Animal Response Team, who's really worked closely with us in monitoring the the, the nests and other. Um, uh, animal life in the surrounding area. Uh, and then also educational outreach. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing, uh, uh, another area where I'd be really uh, m making a mistake if I, I didn't individually identify and recognize the amazing support we've gotten from the military with regard to volunteer work days. They've, um, Army, Marines, Air Force, different groups have come out and also surrounding uh, universities, uh, BYUH and, and others. So, um, but the, the final piece to what we do, and I like this photo because you've got the school children in the foreground. And if you look in the distance, that is the Turtle Bay Resort. Um, so it's, it's, it's not too far out. Most of our work days, the, 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 the volunteers hike out to the site. Um, we try to educate them on their way out. It's, it's a beautiful hike and it's a good way to start the day. Um, but again, this is a, a good example of a public private partnership and, um, and really the, the leveraging of these amazing resources that are available. Uh, and then just leaving, uh, you know, this is what it's all about. Young kids getting out there and people that are passionate about it, planting the, the proper trees as, um, as we eradicate and move out the invasive species. And really at the end of the day, just restoration success to date, over 3,500 volunteers, over 22,000 native plants outplanted. These don't include those that are coming back out of the seed bank. Over 12,000 pounds of mar marine debris removed, which we really appreciate, um, again, the help of Surfrider Foundation in that regard. Over 200 tons of invasive plants removed, that's a big number, but Ironwoods are very heavy. And so we're, we're basically removing a, a 30 acre ironwood forest over time. And so that, that number will go up. And again, I touched on it earlier, nine albatross nests this year. Um, we're, we're hopeful and looking forward to three of those um, fledging. Uh, to date, seven acres of dune habitat restored, which is you know opening the door for all of this other wonderful activity out there. Um, and and a very major increased cover of native plant species. Uh, one other partner I do want to touch on because they've really helped on the educational standpoint, especially with the young kids, is uh, Kokua Hawaii Foundation, who's 
been excellent in supporting the educational outreach, which we do with surrounding schools and interest, interested schools across the island. So at the end of the day, um, through these partnerships and with the help of a phenomenal community and great network, we've been able to start the process of restoring what is a magical and special piece of land. And we're really excited um, that so far nature is uh, endorsing our efforts and we'll continue to try to work together with that network of people to uh, make this piece of uh, our coast more resilient, um, leveraging natural mitigation efforts uh, to do that. So thank you to all our um, contributors, uh, photo contributors and everyone else. And I uh, also thank you again to EESI and to uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, I felt like somehow we, we, we didn't quite fit, but I, I think at the end of the day, we connected the dots and, and uh, hopefully it all makes sense. So really appreciate everyone's time and uh, hope that if uh, once this COVID-19 situation is resolved and if you do um, make your way to the islands uh, that you'll visit our, our, our site and see firsthand what a magical and special place it is. Thanks, Adam. That sounds great. Um, the photos looked awesome and congratulations on the albatross, albatrosses. Um, well, now we have Q&A. So now is where we really get into weaving the four presentations, your different perspectives together. Um, and like I said, we've been getting some really good questions in. Um, but I'm going to start with one um, that I, I'm, I think will be a good one to, to kick us off. And Alex, we're going to go back and we're going to start with you. We'll go through the order of your presentations. You may have to answer the question differently depending on your perspective. But I'm in, we heard at the, at the outset lots about green banks. I'm wondering, Alex and Gwen, what's the, what are the next steps you foresee as far as green bank development goes? You can have a national perspective, you can have a Hawaii perspective, whatever works. And then for Anu and Adam, um, I'd like you to think, when it comes to you, I'd like you to think a little bit about sort of what the green banks need to, how the green banks might evolve to um, become a bigger resource for the adaptation efforts. Um, that you're either managing yourself or that you're seeing your partners manage um, in Hawaii. But Alex, we'll start with you and then we'll go through Gwen and Anu and we'll come back to Adam. Sure, great. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, and really lovely, wonderful presentations from, from my colleagues uh, who presented. Thanks for, thanks for all that, I enjoyed it. Um, so I would say that in terms of where green banks are headed, um, like I said in the beginning, green banks are often in the business of tackling the toughest tasks uh, in financing of clean energy markets, or uh, in this case, uh, adaptation uh, markets. And so, um, you know, we're not looking, we're not going out and trying to, you know, offering competitive financing to a solar farm in, uh, uh, in the Nevada desert. There's plenty of money available for that at great rates, no need for us to compete there. That's not what we do. What we would do is if there's some added wrinkle um, to that project, for example, an energy storage adder uh, that might be making lenders nervous, we can step into the capital stack and play our role to mitigate some risk. Um, and that's the kind of example of, of where I think green banks are really going to be going, where you're going to find us with a nose for the tough tasks ahead. And I would sort those into three um, uh, categories that are, are somewhat apples and oranges, but uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, the first is uh, uh, energy storage, exactly as I just said. Uh, the energy storage financing market is pretty much exactly where the solar energy, the solar energy financing market was a decade ago. Uh, you know, it's a technology that's proven, it's commercially viable, but it's also not widely deployed. Um, and uh, it does uh, kind of give lenders heartburn, uh, especially if you're dealing uh, more at the state and local level um, in, as opposed to a money center bank. Um, so the, the uh, being involved in the financing of energy storage is I think a really important component of the future of green banks. Um, we're currently creating in the process of creating the Nevada Clean Energy Fund, which is gonna be Nevada's green bank. And uh, they, uh, they are likely to um, uh, be focused on energy storage financing uh, as much as possible. 
Um, we also have a number of other green banks that have started financing energy storage technologies as well, um, including Glenn. Um, in uh, uh, the second one that I would describe is, um, is uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, it's resilience. Um, you know, and I've, I've hopefully gone into sufficient detail in, in the previous talk on that. But that's really a next frontier for green banks, as I said, you know, finding ways, sniffing out those cash flows and savings uh, so that uh, lending becomes a more natural uh, process um, uh, with adaptation projects. And then the third area I, I think green banks, I'm 100% sure green banks are headed in is LMI. Um, you know, the, these are the tough markets uh, for a lot of lenders. Um, and uh, whether through just institutional inertia or um, uh, a, for whatever reason, um, it's, uh, it's much more difficult to uh, uh, get a loan in LMI communities um, and communities of color specifically. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the solution that green banks are looking to provide is by putting a really strong focus on making sure that our activities are in this market, that green banks are supporting these traditionally underserved um, areas of the country. Um, and uh, that's, that's something that we're, we're really focused on. You heard from Gwen that, um, that, her, that uh, the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority um, is, uh, is already way ahead of the curve on that one. Um, but I think you'll see more and more green banks really make a big pivot to focusing on financing clean energy and energy efficiency and uh, adaptation solutions in, um, in uh, LMI uh, communities in their jurisdiction. Gwen, you're ahead of the curve, but what's the next leading edge look like for you all? Sure, yeah, we're the uh, different sources of funds for our green bank in particular would really benefit is right now our source of funds is uh, very limited. We are limited to what we can finance, primarily rooftop solar. Um, if we were able to expand our funding um, sources and expand what we are able to finance in the short term, um, you know, I, I think green banks, as Alex said, is not to compete with uh, traditional lenders. If, if it can be financed with, by a traditional lender, then it should be. However, we should be there to help facilitate new technologies um, and, until the traditional lender feels comfortable doing it by themselves um, in order to uh, move the, the, the industry forward. I'll give you an example, uh, anaerobic digesters. You know, if we were able to finance anaerobic, anaerobic digesters that can take the green waste and pu push it through a digester, power up, say, our water supply or municipal buildings, maybe the byproduct will be uh, fertilizer that does a couple of things. It lowers the cost for the municipal buildings, but it also takes out of our landfills tons and tons of green waste. Um, so th that's one example. Um, uh, many other examples for us in the short term, it would be to finance things that um, are not able to be financed tr uh, traditionally, um, but it's also to enable uh, other ratepayers who are not able to get financing uh, traditionally uh, access to it, as Alex said. Great. And Anu and Adam, um, sort of what needs to change in terms of green banks for them to be sources of funding for the kind of projects that you all are working on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I'll just sort of stick to the order of the panels. No, don't mean to jump in in front of Adam, but um, so uh, one of the things that we tackle um, not very successfully right now, but hopefully uh, that's getting better, is, you know, for instance, the, the properties up on the North Shore or anywhere else where we're facing coastal erosion, um, there are sort of, in general, perverse policy incentives to put things back in place where, when a disaster happens rather than trying to find a better place for it. So people, of course, you know, you've bought a parcel of land, it's, something's happened to it, and you want to go back and rebuild, and you get all kinds of monies to be able to do that. But looking at coastal erosion, <clears throat> we're trying to move things, you know, doing those dreaded words, managed retreat. We're trying to, to do that. And um, we haven't really begun doing that in Hawaii, but our sister states have been doing that to some uh, degree, varying degrees of success. 
<clears throat> so I wonder if there is a frontier for the green banks when they use, for example, Gwen, you know, even when you have funding that is limited to rooftop solar, rather than the rooftop solar going where the houses are, could the houses go where the rooftop solar is? You know what I mean? So could there be incentives, or maybe there already are, incentives that um, make people go somewhere else to when they rebuild, because there are these incentives from green banks that they can then put rooftop solar on their houses, whereas previously maybe they couldn't, or maybe now because they've had a storm washout parcel of, portion of their parcel, you know, those kinds of things. So just looking at those, even the narrow incentives, when you're bringing those incentives in, can they bring in the co-benefits of not only mitigation, which is not just an only, but, you know, but also bringing in that, that um, adaptation side where you're encouraging people to come back here and say, hey, I got financing for you if you come back here, you know, that kind of thing, right? So that's one where you're looking at sort of um, private property and parcel by parcel uh, retreat. But um, when we're looking at public infrastructure, you know, is there a place for green banks in there to uh, help with green bonds or, I don't know, private leveraging private capital uh, to help us bring those private and public funds together to make it more attractive to build somewhere else and to build it stronger, higher, and more resilient. I mean, it's sort of sounding a little bit like the Olympics here, but <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Great, thanks. And I think you get the word for comfiest uh, webinar position. <laughs> Adam, um, what would it take to get uh, a green bank listed in your list of funders at the end of your presentation? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess what I've learned about green banks through Gwen and, and Alex and, and getting to know them, and, and I feel that uh, they, they fulfill a very, very vital role, um, but they also um, have a very focused um, purpose at, at this point, uh, and which makes it all the more important that the kind of vision necessary at both the local, state, and, and federal level with regard to our typical funding sources, because unlike uh, a microgrid or other things where they can monetize at some level. Yes, they're taking additional risk or they're doing something that a conventional bank might not be willing to do because of their sense of purpose with regard to their green bank perspective. However, they, they do need to get paid back and they will re-engage that money as a bank does. Um, our work is a little uniquely different. We don't have, we, we've uh, been unable in a traditional sense to monetize the, the good work that ourselves or our, our partner organizations or others like us do. That said, for somewhere like Hawaii, we are, uh, we do feel that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good sign that both the city and state have seen the value of, of creating funds that can preserve uh, such property. But yeah, we just, we, we don't have the, the financial uh, resource as a small 501c3 to really, um, we kind of bootstrap it as it is. And, and the notion of having a, a bank loan um, is, is daunting for, for an organization like ours. But that's not to say that things don't continue to evolve and, and um, Alex and Gwen continue to do the wonderful things they're doing. And at some point, maybe there's new opportunities for them. Thanks. Uh, all right, well, we have some questions that are coming in and I'm keeping an eye on the time too. Um, the first question, uh, I mentioned at the outset that we're almost done our Coastal Resilience Briefing Series, but we have a few more. Uh, and one of those areas that we're looking at that we haven't studied yet involves Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And this next question specifically addresses uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and also Guam. And the question is, how can the lessons of Hawaii with respect to the Green Bank, the increasing or improving access to affordable capital, the climate resilience, the climate resilience financing, how can the lessons of Hawaii be moved around to other island communities and other coastal parts of the country or parts of the country with coasts that are dealing with some of these resilience challenges that don't, don't properly, that don't quite have the Green Bank resource? How can we make sure that these are more widespread? And Alex, um, that's sort of a national policy question. We'll go down through the line again, but we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so that, um, I think the way that green banks can get more resources is uh, uh, through uh, the, climate, uh, the Climate Bank Act that I was referring to earlier. Um, I think that that's going to be the way that we take this movement to scale. 
um, uh, in the interim period, you know, we're making do with what we have on hand, but uh, the leaders of, of uh, my 16 green banks are essentially driving Lamborghinis that are stuck in second gear. Um, and uh, until there's a, a way to, um, to uh, help them access the full range of their automotive performance, um, there's, uh, uh, then they're just going to be uh, doing what they very ably and well and do very well, uh, which is uh, continue their day-to-day -day operations. But uh, the National Climate Bank is definitely the, uh, the path. Uh, we're also raising a fund right now um, that's uh, going to provide low-cost, uh, long-term capital for green banks. Um, but the National Climate Bank is ultimately the, the, the solution. Gwen, you're welcome to substitute an EV metaphor for the Lamborghini <laughs> metaphor, or maybe the, a Ferrari metaphor, since this is a Hawaii-focused briefing like Matt yeah. and I drove. But go ahead, Gwen. Yeah, sure. Just, I just want to add, so, you know, the Green Bank uh, Consortium under uh, the leadership of Alex has been, um, is a very collaborative organization. So, you know, lessons learned, not just from Hawaii, from all green banks, we are all very willing and able to share and help and assist uh, existing green banks or new green banks. Uh, you know, so for Puerto Rico in particular, if they don't have one and they're looking to start one up, um, you know, there is a lot of support available for them, not only in, uh, you know, helping with setups or that type of things, but lessons learned, um, you know, getting on a call with another green bank, finding out more about the program if you want to emulate it that way. So, you know, again, we're here to help each other and others that are, are uh, considering to be born. Anu, do you have any thoughts about um, how replicable the work you're doing in Hawaii is for other island communities or other coastal parts of the country? Well, I'd like to say that I have, you know, some lessons to share, but I think because we're still in the toddler phase <laughs> with our commission, that I'm actually learning from my uh, more learned colleagues on this one, and that uh, resilience to disaster events is always on uh, the top of our minds, even though we are working at the benthic level. Um, but it's also something I think that um, uh, doesn't just happen, you know, in a day. So uh, an event can happen in a day, but then the response to that, and then the shoring up and gearing up for the next one, and, and then being able to bounce back um, is, is really what we're trying to figure out. And the the role of the green banks, if they're at least, you know, at the national level, I know there is all this, um, you know, there's the National Green Bank Act and so on. But in Hawaii, I mean, I just wonder um, and sort of keep throwing it back to Gwen here, but it's almost like we're having a conversation with each other. But, but um, you know, it's just, I wonder like if there's a place for our legislature to expand that role and so on um, at some point. Adam, you work in a pretty unique place. Uh, that's a pretty unique part of the world. But um, what, what of your work could be um, replicated in other island uh, communities or other coastal parts of the country? Well, I think tying into what Anu is saying, I, I think, um, you know, we're certainly still learning. But as I mentioned, with regard to our funding, uh, acquiring funding, both for, at the state and city level, I think what other coastal areas and, and island locales around the world can learn is that, it needs to be a priority. Uh, there, need, there does need to be a funding mechanism of some sort. Um, so where maybe Green Bank's not the fit for us in the here and now. They're fortunate for us here in Hawaii that there is some uh, effort. Um, I'd love to see it increase. Uh, we did host recently um, some, a contingent from uh, Jeju Island's uh, her National uh, Heritage Site in um, Korea. And, you know, we, we kind of just found ourselves talking about a lot of the similar uh, challenges with regard to funding and, and, and um, making sure that it is a priority. Their, their structure, for example, is very different than ours, but, but nevertheless, it's a priority. Much more of their money comes from the private sector. Um, <clears throat> but uh, again, I, I think most important is that um, these kind of efforts, projects like Kuku Point and others, um, we do some dune restoration down the road at Sunset Point where city bike path fell into the ocean a few years back after a big swell event. Um, you know, these, these are priorities and, and they do uh, have a very real impact. So 
I would say that that's what they can learn from, from ANU and what the work that they're doing at DLNR, from Green Bank and the priority they're making to uh, up the, the level of resilience elsewhere is, is again, that it's a priority. Thanks. Um, we're going to wind it down now, but does anyone want to take a shot at handicapping the prospects of uh, the climate bank legislation? I do. Alex, sounds like Alex has an opinion. <laughs> yeah. Am I, am I on, Dan? I think so. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, uh, I do have an opinion. Um, so, uh, there is... Uh, so there are a bunch of, uh, the, here's how I'm approaching this, or how we're approaching this collectively. The first priority right now is in finding out ways that green banks can be of assistance to their communities, and specifically the companies and their companies' workforces that, uh, that um, uh, rely on them uh, uh, for normal course of business and are really struggling right now. What we're seeing is a lot of contractors that are, laying off folks and, and so green banks are currently looking at ways that we can um, help mitigate the, the impact of what is uh, uh, certain to be a, a real rough blow um, for the industry right now. Um, but uh, as uh, the, the a secondary focus for us is to make sure that um, folks realize that uh, the, the points to make the transition from carbon to clean uh, has never been better than right now. Uh, you know, we have interest rates at 25 basis points. Uh, we can do large scale borrowing essentially for free, which is, I know, a casual way of saying it, but it's, it's true at the end of the day. Um, and uh, uh, we can do a lot to help uh, communities rebuild in the wake of this by getting people to work. Um, and we see at the Coalition for Green Capital and the American Green Bank Consortium, um, uh, the construction industry as really well, well suited to be part of the, the great comeback that we're all going to have to make together. Um, and, you know, why not fight climate change while we're at it? Let's uh, get two birds with one stone. Um, so that's all to say that uh, we do feel strongly that uh, any eventual stimulus uh, uh, legislation beyond what uh, needs to be done immediately for healthcare workers. And, you know, let's prioritize that. <laughs> and that's job number one right now uh, for healthcare workers and for the afflicted. Um, beyond that, uh, as, uh, including uh, money for a climate bank and any stimulus package is kind of a no brainer to, uh, so we can build our, our next uh, 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 power plat clean power platform um, and put a lot of people to work while doing it. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's it. And um, we're also feel very good about if in the absence of stimulus inclusion uh, next year, we think that we see a real window for climate change package passing and we intend to be in it. Great. Gwen, you're welcome to have the last word and then we'll end there. Great. Just a real quick thing. So everything that Alex said, but I, I do want to say that definitely we need to deal with the pandemic as it is now, but we also need to keep our eye on recovery because we will get past this and funding the Green Bank uh, 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 Act will be, it's, it's the ultimate impact investment. We're, we're talking people, planet, prosperity. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Sorry, and one last thing is we, were, we are helping our, especially our low moderate income households, uh, put a little bit more money in their pocket. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much. And sorry for interrupting. It was a, um, a glitch there, but thanks so much. This is the point in the pan or in the in a traditional briefing where there is an eruption of applause um, for our wonderful panelists. So you'll have to use your imaginations for that. Um, and I'm not going to clap because it'll freak out the microphones. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much, um, Alex, Gwen, Anu, and Adam. This thank was a you. tremendous panel. Um, and uh, such great stuff being done in Hawaii. And um, while I wish you were here in DC with us, I also kind of wish I was there with you because it is really nice there. Um, we'll go ahead and wrap. Um, this will be uh, of, of the materials that you've seen, um, the written materials, there'll be a webcast as well. It'll all be available at esi.org. While you're there, please sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our newsletter. Um, please also take a moment to fill out our survey. Um, 
we're still new with this webinar thing and uh, your feedback will be really, really helpful to us so that the next couple that we do, however long this lasts. Thanks to the ESI team, specifically Anne Marie, Anna, Amber, Ellen, and Dan O'Brien for all the work that went into today. And thanks again, panelists, for being so flexible and for being with, willing to be with us remotely today. It was a really great panel. I really, really appreciate all your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, thanks for your leadership and bringing this together. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And we'll go ahead and there. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.